evening. Welcome to the Board of Education regular meeting, October 21st, 2019. Could we have a roll call, please? Here. 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 Thank you. The first item on the agenda is written communication. Dr. Bavis, do we have any? Uh, we have no written communication this evening. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're in the information items. The first item is recognition of the Na National Merit and National Achievement Scholars. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Beth Airy from our College and Career uh, Office, as well as uh, Taya Kinsey here uh, with her and from Student Services uh, to help us with this recognition. But I just want to say uh, they will explain uh, how uh, uh, splendid and important and rare uh, tonight's honor is. And, uh, and, and as they do, I just want us to keep in mind uh, that we're joined this evening by students and, uh, and, and uh, family members, guests, who are um, really deserving uh, of this recognition. Uh, they have achieved something that a very small percentage of people across the country year after year, generation after generation, are able to achieve. It's a big deal. And to all of you, before you're even introduced, uh, I, I just want to tell you how proud we have, are of you and uh, how we know what a big deal this is. And, uh, and uh, we are just so happy for you. Uh, I'll also give a couple of directions. <clears throat> They'll be introducing you. And as they do, uh, come on up uh, and stand so we can actually see you uh, a, 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 as we learn about you. But then don't go back to your seat. Just step over to the side by the window and wait until everybody has been introduced. And then we're going to have you come around the uh, horseshoe uh, so everybody from the board can shake your hands. Uh, and uh, so we can also give you one of our prized ETHS pins. Uh, uh, the, the, these are at high demand uh, and we have invested a fortune in them. But in fact, what matters most is the recognition of your honor and of you being, uh, being uh, honored uh, by the school board. Uh, so our president, um, Pat Savage Williams, will give that to you as, as you go around the horseshoe. Yes. I'll remind you of that again as long as you just remember, stay up <laughs> by the window. And Beth Airy. Good evening. Good evening. Over 1.5 million juniors in about 21,000 high schools entered the 2020 National Merit Scholarship Program by taking the 2018 <coughs> PSAT NMSQT, which served as the initial screen of program entrance. Nationwide pool of semifinalists representing less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors includes the highest scoring entrance in each state. There are approximately 16,000 semifinalists in the 65th Annual National Merit Scholarship Program. These academically talented high school seniors have an opportunity to continue in the competition for National Merit Scholarships worth more than $31 million. To be considered for a National Merit Scholarship Award, semifinalists must fulfill several requirements to advance to the finalist level of competition. To become a finalist, the semifinalists and a high school official must submit a detailed scholarship application in which they provide information about the semifinalist academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership abilities, employment, and honors and awards received. A semifinalist must have an outstanding academic record throughout high school, be endorsed and recommended by a high school official, write an essay, and earn SAT scores that confirm the student's earlier performance on the qualifying test. So we have the honor of recognizing seven students who are semifinalists, and each of them have successfully completed the application to continue in the competition, of which we hear later details um, in the spring. So I would like to first announce the two individuals who are unable to join us this evening so that we can continue to at least recognize them and their honors. Um, for being semifinalists. The first is Elise Johnson. Elise is the co-president of the WISDEM Club, an officer of the ETHS speech and debate team, and is one of the junior council of connections, is on the junior council for connections and the homeless. 
The classes Elise has enjoyed the most are her math classes every year because they present her with challenging problems and teach her how to think outside the box. After high school, Elise plans on going to college and as of right now, also wants to work toward law school and eventually work in the criminal justice system. Our second student who could not be with us tonight is Eleanor Ward. Eleanor is on the speech and debate team. She serves as an executive board member and competes in public forum debate. She is also an involved peer tutor at ETHS and the Mathnasium, a local math tutoring center. Eleanor is a member of the Community Service Club and a co-leader of the DRIVES Committee. She is also a ChemPhys mentor and on the ChemPhys mentorship leadership team. Eleanor has enjoyed ChemPhys as it has provided a very unique classroom experience. She values the continuity established allowing for truly in-depth learning. Also being in class with the same students over three years fostered a tight-knit community-oriented environment that focuses on rigor and collaboration. While always being challenged in the class, Eleanor feels comfortable knowing that her peers and teachers are there to support her. As for her post high school plans, she plans on majoring in math in college. So now for our students who are present, we will start with Alex Duncan. Alex, come on up. At ETHS, Alex plays violin in the orchestra and is involved in the Japanese language and exchange program. Outside of school, Alex sings and does visual art as well. Over the summer, Alex did some research at Northwestern University's astrophysics department. Alex feels the chem phys program has had the most impact on her because it developed Alex's interest in a STEM career. Her Japanese classes have also given Alex a community and helped her grow. After graduation, Alex plans to go to a four-year university to study engineering. Alex Duncan. <laughs> Next, we have Caroline Laverick. At ETHS, Caroline is involved in the dance company, where she dances in shows and competitions and choreographs for her peers. Caroline also dances outside of school since the age of three. Caroline is also very involved with the special education program at ETHS. She currently runs Dynamite Dancers, teaching students in the special ed department a dance to perform with the ETHS dance company at pep rallies. She is also a peer leader and a club member with Best Buddies. AP bi Biology was very interesting to her and she also really enjoyed AP Psych this year. Those two classes combined have piqued her interest and have formed the foundation for what she plans to study in college. Caroline wants to attend college where she plans on studying neuroscience or psychology to better understand the biology behind brain disorders. She may choose to pursue special education in the future or continue in psychology to treat mental health and cognitive disabilities. Caroline. <laughs> Next we have Brendan Long. Brendan has been on the ETHS swimming and water polo teams since freshman year and is captain of the swim team this year. He has been in the ETHS Symphony Orchestra for three years. Outside of ETHS, Brendan has been on the, the y, 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 the, the Flying Fish swim team Sorry, <laughs> for 10 years and has studied violin at the Northwestern Music Academy for 13 years. His favorite classes have been Chem Phys, AP Lang, Orchestra, and Math. Brendan plans on going to college and studying something STEM related. Brendan Long. <laughs> Next we have Samuel Tannen. At ETHS, Sam is heavily involved in the music program and has been for all four years. He participates and performs in the concert band, marching band, and jazz bands, playing trumpet. In the community, Sam is a bugler for the American Legion Post in Evanston and has played at the dedication of the New Fountain Square Memorial, as well as the Veterans Day and Memorial Day services. The classes that have really pushed him to pursue a career in science have been AP Chemistry and Biology. Both classes have really been engaging from start to finish. After graduation, he intends on pursuing a degree in biology and take a job here in Chicago, in, in the Chicago Health System in public health. We have Samuel Tanner. And now we will have um, Allison Weiler. Allison Weiler. 
At ETHS, Ellie has pursued her two major passions, art and music. She is a trumpet player in the Wind Symphony, the Symphony Orchestra, and the Jazz Ensemble. She has been selected to represent ETHS at the North Shore Honor Band each year. Ellie has simultaneously pursued her interest in art and drawing. While at ETHS, she has had two teachers who have truly impacted her. Mr. Simos, who has not only encouraged her as an artist, but also as a person, and Dr. Hill, who has sparked in her an intellectual curiosity about history and how it intersects with every aspect of the world, his love of art in particular. Ellie is planning to attend a college that will allow her to pursue her love of art and music while still getting a liberal arts education. Ellie's goal is to have a career as a children's book author and illustrator. Allison Weiler. All right, so now you guys. All right, now the big test. Come on parade. around the horseshoe and congratulations again. Congratulations. <laughs> And there they are, National Merit Semifinalists. <laughs> and I failed to say, you're more than welcome to leave. I'm sure you're dying to stay for the rest of our meeting. Uh, but uh, uh, We're not thank you for coming. You <laughs> Congratulations to you. Thank you for being here tonight. There's, cookie, thank you, there's cookies on the table. You oh, should let them yeah, know. Yeah, don't, don't, yeah, get some yeah. cookies. <laughs> yeah, grab, grab a cookie. Okay, it's always a great way to start a meeting. Hey, Echo, good to see you. Okay, so our next item is report of student activities, and I think yeah, Nicole we, and Denise Nicole? are here, so we'll turn it over to Super. them. Super, great. Good evening. Try that again. Good evening. Good evening. All right, we're gonna start, we'll introduce in just a moment, but we will start with our extracurricular activity philosophy. Forgive me as this is the only one that I will read in its entirety. At Evanston Township High School, our goal is to inspire a lifelong passion for learning. We provide a variety of opportunities for learning in the classroom and beyond through the arts, sports, and activities. Extracurricular activities are an integral part of many students' high school experience. Positive participation in activities helps to increase students' engagement in the school community. Extracurricular activities provide all students with opportunities to develop aspects of leadership, self-discipline, responsibility, teamwork, self-confidence, commitment, student wellness, while pursuing an interest that may lead to a career or lifelong hobby. Extracurricular activities offer participants the opportunity to be leaders and role models on campus in, and in the community and enable participants to represent the school district in a positive manner. So very simply stated, the goal of our department is simply to get students involved in extracurricular clubs and activities and events. This is in line with the district's goal number two, which is to connect each student with supports to ensure that each student will experience social emotional development and enhance academic growth. We are a small but mighty team, the dream team here. I'm Nicole Boy, the Director of Activities in the Student Success Center. This is Denise Clark to my right. She is our Extracurricular Activities Coordinator. She joined us in the fall, as well as Katherine Roseman, who couldn't be here tonight. She um, was new to us last year as well. Um, she's our Student Engagement Specialist. So last year, we offered um, a little over 60 clubs um, or activities. And um, for clarification, these are non, non fine arts and non sports. Um, and they cover a variety of different interests, anything from student government to publications, um, like a satirical newspaper, the Evanstonian, to service organizations like um, our community service club. Last year, we had about 1,200, not about, we had 1,299 students involved. 
um, and um, we can look at um, our involvement numbers over the last five years and compare it to the student enrollment. And then we can see the number, the percentage of students um, overall who were involved um, in a club or activity. Um, so we're looking again, um, the, this is for students who participated in two or more clubs. So we may have had a student who was an ambassador and in the community service club, or a student who did the knitting club and was part of the cooking club. So we had 532 students who um, did at least, or did two or more activities. We also look at it by grad year. So last year our seniors and our sophomores were um, really highly involved. And then here we have it. Um, this is by number by federal race code and then I'll show you percentages in a moment. Um, and we can see who was involved um, over the last five years in terms of um, their race breakdown. Okay. And here we are looking at the percentage of students in each uh, racial demographic of the, their percentage of involvement. So for example, last year we can see we had about 23% of our black students were in a club or activity. So we offer some clubs that are competitive that perform, compete, or represent for this school. And so I want to share some highlights from some of our competitive groups. First is our Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, or our SHIP Junior Program. They are sponsored by Michelle Vasquez and compete annually at the Chicago Regional Science Bowl. Last year, they struggled a little bit at competition and didn't place. And that's the first time in about nine years that they weren't able to place. But it was the competition was really tough, but some strong competitors. Um, they did attend their national conference in Cleveland, Ohio, and over this summer coming up, they're looking to have a reunion with their um, some SHIP alumni over the last 10 years in partnership with the team at NU who um, oversees our chapter. Our DECA club is a very decorated group. They competed at the Illinois DECA State Career Development Conference. We had several top 10 placements. Um, most, the majority of our students um, advanced to our international competition. I won't read all of those, but you can see we placed very well and they shared several pictures with us. This is at their international competition. Um, I would like to thank the Booster Club because they provided the DECA with the, the blazers and the um, emblems on their blazers for competition. Our mock trial team came in third place at state. They were a really young group last year, mostly freshmen and sophomores and majority female, which we're excited about. A little bit of um, a different, a different demographic for them, but they came in third place at state. They've got a trophy in the main lobby that we're really excited about. They um, came in first place at the Lake County um, Mock Child Invitational Tournament. The sponsors are Kevin Capick and Allison Chiaro. Our chess team also um, had a really busy year. We, all, we always host a competition here the first week of November, um, an invitational, and we also came in third place at sectionals. This, we've seen a lot of growth in chess. They've got a JV and a varsity team. Um, we did take a group um, out of state to compete in an all-girls national competition. Our JV team came in first in conference, so our chess team um, is doing very well. At the beginning um, of last school year in the fall, um, uh, Phil Wong, an alumnus, he, from the class of 69, reached out to uh, David Putransky in our alumni office because he was, he ran into one of his um, former classmates who was also a member of the chess team and they orchestrated a reunion of about 50 or 60 uh, participants over the years and they came in and had a, um, a tournament against our, our current our, our team at the time. So um, it ended up being a, almost an all-nighter and they had a really, really great time in um, competition with our kids. It was awesome. 
Um, our Scholastic Bowl team did very well too. This is another program that's grown. They have a JV team and a varsity team. Um, uh, they were undefeated in the CSL conference. They were the regional champs, came in third place at sectionals. They competed nationally as well. And then we'd like to shout out um, the, the senior, now graduated, Benny Keown for his all sectional honors. Um, Terry Gatchel is the sponsor for that. And then the Evanstonian and the Key, they compete together in the IHSA journalism sectionals. They came in second place in sectionals. Um, in addition to um, some sectional acknowledgments, the Evanstonian submits for other um, awards and acknowledgments. They came in first place for newspaper ranking at the American Scholastic Press Association. They received first place for sports photography and first place for a front page. And then on the right, there are some um, um, placements from sectionals for the yearbook. Uh, Patty Del Cruz is the Evanstonian sponsor and Sarah Young is the Keith yearbook sponsor. Um, so in our department, we're really busy marketing and recruiting and really trying to encourage students to get involved. Um, we spend a lot of time with the freshman class and incoming freshmen. We start the year off at the freshman assembly. Um, we present um, along with athletics, community service, and fine arts to bash classes. We host the student activities fair in our senior courtyard um, when the weather's nice. Um, we also <laughs> partner with athletics for the incoming freshman sports and activity fair in Beardsley Gym. We go to visit Access ETHS um, classes during summer school. Um, last year, Kathy and Denise um, went to District 65 middle schools with um, athletics and fine arts. Uh, we attend the transfer student lunch and we match their interests um, with um, uh, clubs and activities and connect them with sponsors. We go into cafeterias during lunch periods and then all of the other ways we would advertise digitally. Happy Friday, this is a picture of the ambassadors um, doing Happy Friday, different groups will do it on Fridays, um, advertise events coming up or club meetings or awareness, things all outfitted and passing out something. So that's a fun way to market. And then we are a very, very, very busy department. Um, and we um, make a lot of strong contributions to the um, school community and the culture and climate. So we do things for staff as well as things for students. And there's kind of an exhaustive list of all the things that we were involved in last year. We'll highlight a few. Homecoming is always a great way to kick off the school year. Last year, our royalty were ja Jaheem Holden and Caitlin Etam. And the dance theme is Here We Glow Again. Um, and that is Beardsley Gym. A lot of people don't believe that, but that we totally transform that space. Um, a school-wide initiative we do in the winter is candy grams. Students will come to the main lobby and they can purchase um, cards to send with, um, to write personal notes and send a candy treat to students in their third period class. Um, an effort to make sure everyone receives something. Student council does something additional for every student, so every student receives something. Um, one of the one of the days that we most look forward to, um, students always want to do this, is serve hot cocoa and um, donuts in the lobby. Um, um, the Friday before winter break, which really gets us excited to have some time off. It's really festive. The fine arts department, they have music playing um, in the lobby and they, there's some caroling. It's a great time. The junior class hosted the De-Stress Fest. Last year was the second annual. We, they brought in therapy dogs right before our first semester exams. Um, and they had a trail mix bar and some brain food. Um, um, and students got to spend some time with um, the organization is called Rainbow. I can't think of the complete name, but they are the ones who provided the therapy dogs. Uh, we had a really, really active group of seniors last year who hosted the Senior Assembly and the Dreams Delivered Fashion Show. We partner with the women from the Women's Club of Evanston who provides free prom dresses and accessories for um, our students. Um, this is a student-run um, assembly and it's tons of fun for the entire class in preparation for prom and graduation. We also had a really diverse group of kids who do the planning for prom and post-prom. We had just come from Navy Pier. Um, they did, they selected the menu, do a food tasting and all of the details for prom. Um, we um, uh, went on the Mystic and on the Spirit of Chicago so they could um, make some decisions about what they wanted their prom experience to be like. 
um, the royalty for prom last year were Lance Jones and Madison Corins, and the theme was A Night of a Thousand Lights. It was really beautiful. Once it got dark outside, everything in the room was royal blue and really nicely lit up. Uh, another fun thing before we, um, the four seniors graduate, we kissed them goodbye. Sorry, spoiler alert, Echo. Um, <laughs> Um, we want to thank the Booster Club because we used to do Hershey's Kisses um, and have to really do a lot to assemble, so we asked them if they would buy some personalized M&Ms, which they did, which have Willie the Wild Kids on it and Class of 2019, and every senior um, received at least one note, if not several, um, before they graduated. It was really sweet. Decision day, um, uh, I'm not sure if Beth is still here, but that's she and my favorite day of the year. Decision day is May 1st, um, when our seniors get to, to represent what decisions they've made about their future, if they're going to college or work or take a gap year, they get really creative. Um, students were taking a gap year, buy t-shirts that say gap, some people make their own signs, but this is the day that we want to know where students are going to take their talents and the energy in the hub is ridiculous. We have um, marching band music playing and students running around looking for their balloon. This young man here was going to school in Hawaii and we had a Hawaii balloon, so he was so excited about about that. It's always fun. Um, we also um, are behind the scenes a lot, quite a bit for Staff Appreciation Week, which is in May, which is fun. Last year's theme was building blocks, Lego-ish. Um, at the bottom right is a group of administrators and leaders who did Happy Friday that day and were passing out gifts. This was at Door 2. Door 2 is a lively bunch, so we had a good time that day as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking ahead to this year, um, I'm excited to say that community service is now under my supervision. Um, Mary Collins was our former community service coordinator who's no longer here, and I'm so excited to welcome Diana Balitan back. She was a former um, intern in the community service department. She's a grad of Northwestern, and we're so excited to have her. She is awesome. So she has started and joining her this year is Neil Dixit. He is our PIP fellow from Northwestern and the two of them have such great energy, great ideas. Um, if anybody's ever had the opportunity to meet Diana, she's such, such, such a warm spirit. So we're so happy to have her here. Um, last year, um, our students did about 30, completed about 30,000 hours of community service. Um, so I'm looking forward to be able to report on that information um, or have Diana report on that information <laughs> alongside me next year. So look out for that. Um, so uh, to do what we do, we've got to be able to say thank you. One thing that's not on here but I absolutely have to say publicly is um, our operations department at this school um, is really part of the key to our success here. We can't do anything, especially um, event set up and planning without our operations department, especially when we can call Clarence and Eddie at the last minute and ask for stuff because we forgot to plan in advance. So um, we really, really want to say thank you to our operations department. We want to thank all of our club sponsors, the majority of whom volunteer to serve as sponsors for clubs, especially the special interest groups, the, the groups that do not perform, compete, or represent. Um, we do have several volunteers who work with our students. Um, the Qantas Club of Evanston recognizes our students um, almost quarterly. Um, our ETHS Booster Club is very generous twice a year. They have special allocations and purchase um, about $30,000 worth of equipment for clubs and activities, which we're really grateful for. Um, this picture here is our um, um, sp sponsor appreciation breakfast, which is the um, the last uh, like the last Friday of the school year. Um, they um, provide breakfast to say thank you for our club sponsor sponsors, the Women's Club of Evanston for their donations um, to prom and making the experience a reality for several of our students, approximately 100. Men's Warehouse donates tuxedos for some of our um, students who aren't able to afford them. We have several partnerships with Northwestern. SHIP is one of them. Our WISDEM is another one. We have quite a few and thank all of them. And from Family Focus, who runs the girls group here weekly. Are there any questions? Wow, thank you. That's a lot, a lot going on. So questions from the board, Gretchen? 
sort of comment and question. Thanks so much for all the great information. It's always fun to hear about all the enormous variety of clubs we have going on here. I like the shout out to Knitting Club. Those are my people, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so one question or point of clarification really. Um, so when we have participation numbers, um, we have the unique student calculation across the years and then we have a separate line item for participation in two or more clubs. Is that participation in two or more clubs a subset of the unique student yes. number? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not in addition to, it's part of yes. the unique students would include those who are participating too. Yes. Great, and then secondly, um, I really appreciated you adding in that critical percentage of the student body number on your slide, um, because I don't think it's in the report. Mm -hmm. I'm scrolling through it again, and mm -hmm. I think it's really helpful to see. Um, so my question about that is when we, maybe you could just put up the slide towards the beginning that has percentages across the bottom. Um, the percent, I don't know what story the, the, these numbers tell us, and I'm wondering um, if it's not really, I don't really, there it is, I don't really see a particular trend. We go from 43, 43, 47, so it kind of goes up and then it kind of comes back down and dips a little lower. Is that meaningful? Do we care? Are, are we reaching a saturation point? I mean, do we have just, you know, this is the limit with 60 clubs. We can't dream up any new activities to capture that last, you know, handful um, of kids. I mean, what does this tell us? And so one thing, a noticeable difference between 16, 17, and 17, 18 is some of the clubs that were um, captured under student activities data, um, for example, speech and debate is, is a club that I used to oversee, which is now part of fine arts, which is Got 100 it. students strong, so those students are there. Got we it. also, in athletics, some of the several clubs that were clubs are now um, club sports. Ping which pong, were, table uh, tennis, sorry. Yes, uh -huh, fencing. Yeah. Um, Ultimate Frisbee, boxing, which isn't running, Muay Thai, Taekwondo. Yeah. So several clubs that used to be clubs are Got now it. club sports. Um, so this... Um, that makes, I don't a, that makes a big difference, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple hundred students difference for sure. Yeah, and that's enough to budge the percentages somewhat. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just something to think about and I know, I think we talked about some of this last year a little bit, is this, you know, that we have these different buckets. We have your activities, then we have the fine arts, we have the sports, we have community service. So I, I, I guess at the end of the day, what I, as a board member, what I would be interested in knowing, and I'm not really sure who would tell me this story, I don't think it falls on you necessarily, um, it, it, what we need to know, though, as a board, is the story of mm -hmm. of how, looking at all of our students. How many of them? What percentage of them are participating in any one of those four things? So we four buckets of activities. I think we looked at that about two or three years ago, mm -hmm. um, and there was about at that time, um, there were a little under 700 students who couldn't be captured on anybody's roster. Mm -hmm. um, out of our three departments, um, athletics, clubs and activities, and fine arts. Um, so we did that a couple of years ago, but it also, um, I guess it depends on what we really consider participation because we have, we're taking attendance at all of the summits. Students are participating. Um, we may have students who participate in any given student summit who may not be in the knitting club or the sewing mm -hmm. club. So mm -hmm. there's, um, well, we there's have a lot of touch events. points that we just, yeah. um, it's hard to capture. Um, everybody, like yeah. everything that everyone is doing, but those right. that aren't on a rostered activity about two years ago, it was just under 700. I, I, I feel like that's, that, that's something we should be trying, again, not necessarily falling in you, so I'm speaking sort of more broadly. Um, I think we should be trying to capture that because it really goes to the heart of this goal that the board has about engaging our students. Um, the goal isn't called engagement, but it's, you know, supporting our students and getting them involved. <clears throat> um, 
And I, I, I guess I'd just love for us to be saying, maybe you can put your heads together with your peers in, in athletics, Chris, behind you. And, and now you've got the community service bucket and then the fine arts people. And think about what's a good way um, to share this information with the board and with our, with our school community more broadly. It goes to this point that I made previously about trying to share critical facts about progress we make and work we're doing in a dashboard kind of display. You know, it seems to me this is an area where we've got some room to do something um, helpful in it. And, and then it should, the idea, we're not just reporting it for the sake of reporting it, we're reporting it to figure out where the gaps are so that we can go after. So rather than doing, um, you know, a t targeted event to recruit all freshmen sort of globally standing in the lobby and kind of, that's sort of a passive, I mean, I know you're active, but, but we're sort of expecting that students are going to come to us. If we collect more of this data, we figure out, well, what, what are the subsets of our students who really, you know, like Latinx numbers down, it seems. Uh, well, all, they're all down a smidge, but taking into account the caveat that you made earlier, then maybe there's a particular targeted approach that we're going to take. Well, we really need more participants from this subset of our students, and we can go get, you know, we're going to go get them. I think that a super significant part about getting students involved from a lot of different demographics comes into the leadership um, of students within those clubs and activities. Um, and so I know mm -hmm. clubs and activities that have focused on um, getting those students who weren't necessarily represented um, in the club prior um, have had like made huge gains um, and so I think um, having more leader leadership in these clubs from okay. students focusing on that and um, maybe understanding better how to engage those students um, and having support to engage those students um, I think is a large part of getting more students involved um, because ultimately students join things because they identify with somebody in that group or they see a, a reason why they want to be in that space and a large part of that is their peer involvement. That's a very good point. Monique? Yeah, I, I think the, well thank you for this. I think what ends up happening is that, um, first of all, we have a wonderful school that has just a broad variety of, of, of um, experiences that our students can participate in. So it's, it's hard to tell the complete story, right? And so that's what I see. So what can happen, which I agree with Gretchen in terms of how we capture all of that, is that we can tell the true story of, of engagement um, here at ETHS. Because um, I, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's so deep that we just don't know how deep it is because of so many different areas that our kids can enter. However, the one area that I'm, I am interested in in participation is by gender. Like, I don't know how many of our girls are participating in these activities. Um, I hear about it through the athletic department. I mean, you, Chris will break it down. But I don't know. I, you capture it well by race code. I just don't know if we are engaging um, who we're engaging. You know, just another, another depth of engagement you might know but you know. I do and I probably would need some um, some advice on how to capture that we have done it every year until I think last year mm. um, because I feel like I don't know how to capture students who are um, gender non-conforming or not on the don't identify on the binary mm -hmm. um, and um, well, I'm thinking about that. It's also important to note that our students who are, um, we have a big GSA club, and we don't take their um, data, too. So that's not included here, either. Um, but we did b report girls and boys before, or male and female before. Um, I just kind of need some direction if, mm -hmm. if, if we should continue to do that or not. Mm -hmm. Or how, do we, how are we consistently capturing that? Because we may... I know I've heard reports um, about our, our females that are engaged in STEM opportunities, right? And, and of course in athletics. So how do we figure that out for, for you so that we know exactly who's being engaged beyond just race? Yeah. 
I know that is a super important consideration, um, at least in community service, for example. It is majority white females, and so the, the gender aspect is actually a huge part of um, how the board is thinking about engaging people. And I, I know that it's not always majority female. Sometimes it's majority male. And so I think that would be an interesting um, data to collect and an important one. I was thinking about um, back to um, identifying what the, and I know it's a couple of years old, the 700 students just want to um, just, and I know you, you know this, be cautious about um, not making up stories about those 700 students because we are a very resourced community. We're a resourced school and we have lots of opportunities here, but there are other opportunities in the community and it's quite possible. I, I don't know for sure because I haven't looked at each one of them, um, but I just don't want us to um, make up stories or construct stories about so since they're not involved in at ETHS that doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean they're not involved elsewhere um, so that's that's important correct um, yes Pat. Um, yeah I want to thank you both for this report and all the work that goes behind it because this is a lot um, and it's really exciting um, and I was particularly interested in all the different things you do to recruit and to reach out and and I think what others have said really how are we thinking about students that aren't engaged and I was wondering to what extent do you work with student services or you know we talk about some of these kind of clubs and activities and sports can be kind of an intervention for some kids at a, at a you know maybe a tier one level and I'm wondering to what extent you're kind of working with student services to really maybe really bring that kid in who's resistant but really needs you and it kind of happens quite often quite honestly the counselors will call us or call us down and bring a student to us especially students who are new or transfer students but for some students um, who they have a rapport with or there's some connection or encouragement of family members um, tomorrow second period not second yeah second period will be with um, mr. Johnson and a family um, who um, he reached out because a student needs to be um, involved so we'll work together so we'll come um, we are um, try to be really thoughtful and um, go make the connections easy as possible we'll walk students to a club meeting so they can um, meet face to face and we'll we'll connect people via via email um, and try to personalize it as much as we can so it takes away um, a little bit of the anxiety mm -hmm. about new experiences but that happens almost weekly that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. As everyone has said, I mean, I, this is such a well-resourced school, and um, this is really why I moved back to Evanston. Mm -hmm. This is great. Um, I'd like to bring it back to race. Um, looking at the numbers percentage-wise, um, when you look at the, um, the makeup of the, the student body, the proportion of African-American students um, that are engaged in these activities um, is significantly lower than, for example, white students and Latinx students also significantly lower. Um, are you seeing any factors that you think may contribute to the um, such a, a low proportion according to the, the makeup of African Americans in the school what, what are some factors that you're seeing that may contribute to, um, to this? I don't know if I can um, really speak to that um, with 100% with confidence. Um, what's, I do know that there are quite, a, there's a number of students um, who are involved in athletics or involved in other ways. Um, some students, um, um, that we, well, some students don't see themselves in every group, if I'm being really honest, some things that they've shared. Some students are busy outside of school or work or have um, t family um, obligations. Um, that's not the whole story, but um, I, I can't say that I'm really uncomfortable with the number because I know students are participating in other ways too. Yeah. Um, it would be, um, 
I think um, this is the first opportunity that um, Chris and I have had to report at the same time, so I would really be curious, too, about um, his numbers of involvement in terms of students, black students or any other subcategory. Um, but there are a it could be a variety of different reasons yeah. why students aren't necessarily involved. Yeah, I think it's critical for us to try to get a sense of why that is because as we had, have spoken about before, there is a strong connection between academic achievement and a student feeling that they're a part of the school community and being engaged in, um, in their school and seeing themselves as a part of the school culture. Um, and it can be, a, as, as uh, Pat was saying before, um, um, an intervention. Um, so that's, that's why I'm asking. And I just have something to add. Um, I'm just writing down some notes over here. And I know that you mentioned about the GSA that they are not included here. And I know that the Boule, they work specifically with black boys aren't represented here. The AKAs who work specifically with young black girls, they aren't represented here. <laughs> so we need to go back and really figure out when we talk about the Boule, the AKAs, the summits, and everything that we do, right. how it really shifts and really provides a better picture for mm -hmm. who's involved here. Much and that we're gonna, we're gonna do that. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, other comments, questions? I really um, just have to say, even your philosophy, and thank you for reading it out loud, um, because it's really powerful, I read it, um, and then having, just hearing um, all the, the positive impact of participation, and I know we'll hear even more how this really helps students just really feel a part of this school and this community, and, and you're right, there's even, there's more even so um, they're they're what they're taking away um, in terms of self-discipline and leadership and that confidence build um, this is what they'll remember they they won't necessarily remember those academic courses but they will talk and remember remember this this is very important so thank you thank you both thank you, thank you. nice thank you. All right, followed by the report on student athletes. And Chris Levitino, our athletic director, is uh, getting set up. Actually, while he's doing that, I just wanted to raise up what Echo said. I thought that was really very... Um, a really important point that to get the students involved in the leadership yeah. Yeah. because a lot of clubs a lot of people would love them but they don't know or they haven't been engaged and to have it come from other students and particularly as those groups start to diversify people start to see more people start to see themselves there so I just I just wanted to highlight I think that was a really important point echo Good evening. I'm Chris Lovatino, Athletic Director here at Evanston High School. It's great to be back to presenting to you guys about our year in sports last year. Um, we'll kick things off by talking about, you know, the competitive excellence side of things. Uh, we had an incredible year, um, all things considered. Uh, our boys basketball program uh, finishing as a state runner-up and making it back downstate two years in a row, which has never been done in the history of the school uh, was pretty amazing. Uh, we also had our second year of having two individual state champions, uh, Lucy Hogan and Raman Abraham, uh, won the state championship in diving and wrestling. And Lucy finished an incredible career here. She finished as the state runner-up in diving as a freshman, a sophomore, and then the state champ as a senior, which is, is just incredible um, and is now diving at Michigan. Um, we had eight pr different programs all finish in the top 15 of their respective sports which is uh, just outstanding and such a wide variety of sports. Um, you know, I think it's one of the things that makes Evanston so unique. Uh, we won four different conference championships. And then, you know, while all those things and championships are great, um, sometimes I just like to focus on what I call excellence, which is just programs that within their own program did things that we haven't done before. Uh, girls across 
you know, won more games in the history of the school than they had it before. Uh, football had its most successful season in 20 years. Boys and girls bowling uh, advanced as teams to the IHSA sectional, which we had never done before. And as I look at ECHO, we also had our girls program for golf. Uh, we qualified three girls to the sectional, which we had never done before. And then we did it again this year, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so, so those are a lot of the highlights from the competitive side of things. But I know you guys like to focus, and I do too, on the academic impact that, mm -hmm. uh, that our student athletes have. Um, as well as participation. So academic achievement, a lot of great highlights here. Um, you know, this is the second year since we, uh, we r removed the 2.0 GPA requirement. Um, I think there was some, some hesitancy and, and questions about what's that going to do to the overall impact of our student athletes GPAs. Um, and last year they, they jumped almost uh, two tenths of a, of a number. Uh, this year they increased actually for the highest GPA average we've ever had, uh, which is really remarkable. Um, for the second year in a row, we had 100% of our varsity teams uh, have a team GPA over 3.0, and 82% of our varsity teams have a GPA over 3.5. So the IHSA has a big academic achievement award by team, which the benchmark is 3.0, and every one of our teams hit that. And then 3.5 is just, I, I think it, I think last year, I think it ties what we did last year, no which kidding. was yeah. light years ahead of where we were at before. So it's really, it's really great That's stuff awesome. to see. Um, the numbers that, that have um, been borne out year after year since we started keeping these um, uh, in terms of our GPA by racial subgroup uh, continue to impress. Um, and uh, it's one of the reasons, I think, why we made the move to drop the GPA requirement is we recognize that, that students that were involved in sports or any extracurricular for that matter tend to do a lot better in school. So our differentials are up there. Uh, our Hispanic uh, boys and girls had the, the largest differential between those that were involved in sports and those that were not. Um, but as you can see for each group, it, it's pretty significant difference uh, when they're involved in sports. Yeah. Uh, participation, uh, I'll be honest, last year when I was here I thought I had kind of this heavy heart when I left, and I think I even said it to Marcus, you know, that week. I was like, I don't know that we're going to be able to continue to, to keep having the growth that we've had with students participating in sports. It was really, it was record numbers. And we had even more kids involved in sports last year with over 1,400 unique student athletes and close to 2,200 seasonal athletes. Um, and the percentages are up there, but one thing, if you, if you kind of think about the math here, we had, we had a big increase in individual participation. We had an even bigger one in seasonal participation, which speaks to the fact that we had a lot more students involved in multiple sports as well, which I know has always been a concern and question of, of yours. And so I'm really proud of the fact that I think this trend of specialization, I think we're, we're, we're doing a good job of hitting that head on and we're, we're constantly talking about that with our coaches, with our parents, with our athletes, to try to get them to understand it's good to participate in more than one sport. Um, one thing that, that I think concerned me initially when I saw that our female participation was, uh, was around 47.8% uh, of our athletes was that we used to have more females participating in sports than boys for a little while there. And then I looked at what is our female percentage of the school enrollment, and it's actually 47.7%. So we actually have more females proportionately participating in sports than boys still, which is which is nice to see because that was something we really actively targeted uh, about six or seven years ago. Um, and as you can see, you know, we've increased over the last three years close to 20% of uh, females mm -hmm. in seasonal participation. The, the one area that I'm uh, quite honestly beyond frustrated with and, and really uh, put as one of the major goals that I have for this year is to, to try to identify why our Hispanic participation is, is, is dropping. Um, last year we had a huge jump uh, in our Latina participation by 20% in one year. And while they stabilized this past year, our, our male participation dropped. And, uh, and that's, that's concerning. Um, and it's something that I, I think I want to really try to examine. Why are we, why are we going the opposite direction um, within our Hispanic community? So that's the, that's the one concern I have of our participation numbers from, from last year to this year. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things we, we try to do is build bridges through athletics. Um, 
And a lot of that is done by reaching out to middle schools and the next generation of Wildcats. Uh, we do a middle school multi-sport challenge. Uh, we've been doing that for about six or seven years now, uh, which is great. We get 100, uh, 150 kids in the middle of the winter that come over to the high school, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and just play three seasons of sports uh, with our kids and our coaches, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, the girls play sports clinics, leagues, and summer camp. We've had a, a not just a partnership. We, we created the, the Girls Play Sports program uh, seven years ago, and it's now uh, taken off on its own, and we continue to have a huge um, role in there where we utilize our female student athletes as the leaders within those programs, um, and we impact you know close to 2,000 girls that way uh, prior to the coming to the high school. Uh, the Ron Risch Willie May District 65 track meet is another connection that we have with District 65. And one, I think, of the biggest things that we've done is we've made cost, um, that barrier that, that used to exist for kids participating in sports in the summertime, we've, we've eliminated that to the best of our ability by providing anywhere between twenty-five dollars and $35,000 in financial aid every single summer. And we do that through the sponsorships that we sell during the year. And we, we, we take some of the money that we make off the kids that, that can't afford it, and we reinvest it in the kids that can't. Um, so I think overall we've, we've probably provided close to a quarter of a million dollars in the last 10 years uh, for students that need financial aid in the summertime for camps. Um, building bridges to, to the college level as well. Uh, we had our highest number of seniors go off to play college sports last year with 62. In fact, ever since we instated uh, Joyce Anderson as our college bound student athlete advisor, uh, we've had um, close to twice as many kids participating in collegiate athletics since that time, but it, it's continued to grow. Um, and in the last four years, we have over 200 uh, students that have gone on to play sports in college, which is great. And we, we continue to have strong ties with Northwestern and the Kiwanis Club in terms of communities here in Evanston. Uh, so some new places and faces. I think the, the, um, the biggest facelift uh, that we had this past year was with the Michael B. Arrington Wellness and Performance Center. I hope you guys can make it out to the grand opening that we have this Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to walk up there, it, it is, it's incredible. Um, I haven't had anybody that, that has been involved in college athletics say anything other than this is as good as a Division I athletic uh, strength and conditioning center. It, it's really remarkable. Um, and we really appreciate the ETHS Foundation. Uh, for spearheading that campaign. We could not have done it, obviously, without them. And for Mike Arrington, for his large donation, it's, uh, it's going to have a huge impact, not just in our athletic programs, but I think across the school in terms of wellness and fitness. So, so that's been incredible. Um, phase one of the locker room renovations uh, finished up this summer, uh, which, is, uh, which is really awesome. If, if not just for the locker room that, that we have there now, the hallway that allows you to access one side of the um, athletic wing to the other. Mm. It was, was honestly, it was, it was inequitable for our females, uh, staff and students. They had to, you know, they could not cut through the boys' locker room. And we now have a really beautiful, well-lit, orange and blue uh, <laughs> hallway uh, for you to, to get back and forth between two sides. So that's great. Okay. And, uh, and it's also allowed us, I think, to save some costs from safety as well in terms of staffing. Uh, different areas because we we can kind of control entry points through entrance three now which is great um, and then the last big capital improvement this summer was we replaced the synthetic turf uh, at Mernie Lazier Field which uh, we've gotten great feedback from all the sports teams that have been there uh, it's really top-notch so appreciate that uh, we had we hired uh, four new head coaches uh, three sport coaches Leanne Baker is our new tennis coach uh, Priscilla Rees is a new palm kits coach and Jenner Johnson is our new field hockey coach. Uh, field hockey has had the best season that we've ever had. It's a young program, but we actually have a winning record this year and uh, uh, didn't even get in the play out, the play-in game. We're already in the Sweet 16, so she's done a great job there. Uh, and then Mark Feldner is our head uh, strength coach. Um, and uh, that full-time position um, is really going to pay huge dividends across the board for all of our kids. And you know, as the athletic director specifically speaking about our department, um, I have no doubt it's, it's, it's a game changer for us when it comes to a competitive standpoint. Um, and one of our goals is to try to make sure our athletes really are aware of the sports specific training program that we offer as a course uh, going into next year. I have a lot of future goals up here. <laughs> 
Um, and I don't know that I'm going to read each and, and every single one of them in, unless you'd like me to. Um, but I would say that the, the, the big goal that I, that I have really, like I said before, is I, I want to figure out how we increase our Hispanic participation. It, it's just, it's, you know, when you have everybody moving in one direction, you have one group that's not, there's, there's, there's got to be a reason. And so we got to figure out what that is. Um, so that's a, a major goal of mine. Um, and uh, another, another kind of personal goal of mine is to create a mentorship program that utilizes our, our student athletes to connect with and guide struggling elementary school students. Um, I, I think that was sort of, we did that with Girls Play Sports, and now I think, you know, one of the areas that we've got to try to identify is how do we help um, our struggling um, male population in, in as early as kindergarten and first grade by having mentors at our juniors and seniors at our school come over and, and just connect with them. Um, and not really focus on trying to get them involved in sports, but just utilize and leverage their um, their athletic participation and probably prominence to these young kids' lives to, to impact them around making better decisions and, and being better uh, students at their schools. Um, so those are, those are some of the, the, the goals up there that I, that I want to really personally try to focus on myself. And we're going to try to hit every one of those other bullet points as well. Um, so that's my report. Uh, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. These are excellent goals. Yeah. I mean, I read through them. Those are um, amazing goals. So my, my question, though, is about you say, stated your biggest challenge is our, um, our Hispanic community and, and figuring out why the decline has been there. Do we know where they have participated? You said last year there was a, a bump. In their participation, mm -hmm. do you know where they? The, the bump, the bump came in our female uh, okay. student athlete participation. Our Latinas uh, jumped, and I think a lot of that had to do with the girls play sports program. Right. Their numbers now for participation are really much, much higher um, mm -hmm. within our our uh, Latin community, and so I think we just need to to try to figure out how we do the same thing for boys. Okay, so you know, it's I think we. You know, for all this stuff, you don't just start playing sports a lot of times as a freshman in right, high school. Right, you, right. you really have to figure out how do you start impacting decisions and opportunities well before you come to the high school. And that's not an area we've had a lot of success with in our Hispanic community. And I think okay. that's what we have to try to figure out. Um, and I think we have to got to talk to parents. We got to talk to kids. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I haven't done a good job of that. So okay. I think I got because I was wondering if the decline was in um, certain sports and if that was relational and um it definitely supports your second goal mm -hmm. you know in trying to figure out what if it's the same group that is declining and no longer participating in certain sports then it becomes yeah. you know what really what's going on with that right. team and that coach and so forth or those kids not feeling welcome this year as opposed to right. trying something new next last year and seeing the increase. So, right. but I know you'll, you'll dig in all that, but that's what yeah. I started. Yeah. Thinking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Hi, Chris. Hey, awesome job last season. Oh, thank you. Optimistic for this season too. Um, I want to talk about the GPA requirement. Now mm -hmm. we're in our second year and this may be for Marcus too. Um, we were hopeful and we saw the, how the research was trending and we knew we needed to get more kids engaged and that would uh, hopefully improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so now this is the second year and we see outcomes continuing to improve. So what type of collaborative efforts or supports were put in place, like, I, I, I'm really curious to know, because we were nervous. I talked to you offline you about did. it, even though <laughs> I, I believed in, you know, in theory, but uh, how, did, how did we as a school position ourselves strategically to make sure um, students weren't falling through the cracks? Ms. Boyd, will you come back to the, to the um, table and talk a little bit about what y'all do and how y'all collaborate together? That was a big question. So, 
I mean, yes. the, the, the yes. most significant thing we did is, is obviously is just the rule itself, is, is we eliminated the barrier of participation that used to be a 2.0. Right. And we allowed anybody that was passing five classes or more to participate. And so uh, if you were going to be in that group that was uh, previously going to be ineligible, you, you participated in the academic watch list, which is a semester long, um, for lack of a better term, academic probation period where you have to get academic support either Monday right after school or Wednesday evening, plus two other um, academic supports during the week. You're on study table for the whole semester is another way to say that. And, um, and then we held those students to a higher requirement week in, week out than we did our other students. So other students, you just had to continue to pass five classes. If you're on our academic watch list, now you, you could not have uh, two or more Ds or Fs in a given week and if you did you were ineligible for the next week and the whole idea was instead of um, trying to get kids to think about doing better in school in February so they could be eligible next August we said let's really hit them right when it matters the most and let's focus on their short-term uh, focus and 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 then let's try to make sure that they're putting their effort in so they can be eligible the next week and that, that's really the, we kind of changed the focus from a long-term goal to a short-term goal that had a little bit of impact on kids. And, um, you know, last year of the 35 kids that initially enrolled in, in sports that were in the academic watch list, um, seven students dropped over the course of the semester. They didn't, they, they could not meet that requirement. They were ineligible week after week after week. And so they just said, I, I, I don't want to do this. I quit. And... That's disappointing, but I think it also speaks to the fact that we made it rigorous enough that this wasn't just a, hey, you can show up, we don't care, we just want you to play sports kind of policy. You know? And I, so I, I think there's some value in seeing that this isn't always gonna be for everybody. Um, of the students that remain, 75% of them had an increase in their GPA during the semester that they were on our academic watch list. Um, and of the 14 black males that were involved in the program, only one of them had a GPA that, that went the opposite direction. Um, and, and of that group, 18 student athletes uh, would never have had the opportunity to participate under the old rule. They would just would have been completely disconnected. And, and I think, to me personally, that's, that was really one of the main goals of that, is to make sure that we don't lose a connection with 18 that's that, yeah, students. That's that. you know? So, um, so I, I hope that answers. A little bit and speaks sure to your question a little bit yeah. better. We, yeah. We've also had that from the student ath activities yeah, point of view yes. too. Yes. Can you speak to Ms. Roseman's work? So that's um, Ms. Clark's work. Um, and for us in student activities, for the clubs that this um, um, applies to, we didn't. We don't have anything to report. We had one student in year one who would have been on the academic watch list, but I can't even remember in this moment exactly what that issue was. It was a technical thing and not an actual situation. Our competitive clubs are more academic centered, like our Scholastic Bowl, our Ship Junior. So these are students, and for lack of better way to say it, that we've typically seen who are already achieving well academically so we weren't um, attracting new students to scholastic bowl who couldn't have done it before um, so there's more of an impact in terms of, of athletics than it was in terms of the the clubs that perform compete or represent for us makes sense yeah. though only one would have been um, um, the e-squad step team um, but um, we've had students on study table um, repeatedly but not on the academic watch list there was I think it was chess and I there was some specific thing oh you know what it was um, um, the student uh, it appeared that the student wasn't passing enough classes here but the student was also taking classes at Northwestern so um, we, we had to <laughs> had to reach out to the professor um, to just let us know at any time if the student was pass, <laughs> passing the class with the C or better. So we, we weren't going to have the professor, um, I knew it was going to come back to me, I had to think about what it was. Um, take it. A yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what a problem. So yeah, we didn't, um, we weren't experiencing a, a new wave of students who weren't able, who were previously unable to participate. But that's probably the nature of our competitive clubs.
Thank you. We just have to get more of them involved mm -hmm. across the board. And thank you for thank bringing you. that to us because you're right. We we did have some. Um, we were we were nervous about this, and even just hearing those numbers, mm -hmm. um, the 18 students who would have not been eligible to continue um, and now they are continuing and, and it sounds like you are doing a really good thorough job following up on what they need academically and staying with them um, for this time so yeah, you'll you. continue to bring that to us I hope absolutely thank you I, I think the paradox of that is you know when you think about well we we made a uh, a lesser GPA requirement yeah. uh, in order to give more opportunity. And that sounds like we lowered expectations, when in fact, if you think about it, we raised expectations. We said to these students, we really believe in you. Yep. We have high expectations for you. We think that you're going to benefit by being able to participate, but there are some requirements now that go along with that. And so, I, again, I, I think it's paradoxical that sometimes people think, well, if you've, if you've moved the, the bar down, you must be expecting less. When, in fact, what we communicated to these young people is, we have high expectations yeah. for you. Yeah. And they've done it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It's quite a story. And then, even with students who could have a lower GPA in the cumulative GPA of a team, so it could conceivably make those team GPAs mm -hmm. slide just a little bit. Mm -hmm. We look at what's happened, mm -hmm. and the team GPAs yeah. have actually been going up. Yeah. So the uh, first two years um, that we've had 100% above 3.0 yes. in, in a couple of years. So it, it was once we got rid of the GPA that requirement. That is a story. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, so um, thank you for all the additional information on the 2.0 uh, mm -hmm. elimination of the requirement because that was my first question and I'm really excited to see that because all the all the comments that have been made I think it was the right decision and and it's playing out so that and I know that doesn't come without work so thank you both for mm -hmm. for doing that work um, there were two your goals are terrific Chris I had two that I really was glad to see one um, the increase in teachers um, as coaches I think you know, we're doing so much to do climate and culture here. And those people who are in the building all day are getting that a lot in a lot of different ways. And so I think that's a great goal. So mm -hmm. I, I applaud you. And the other was getting um, students of color in more traditional white um, sports. I think it's like what we talked about a few minutes ago with activities that, you know, the more we can take the depths of our equity work into every little nook and cranny and, and start to get you know, more Latinas and African Americans in the, you know, mock trial or get, you know, the sports um, diversified. I think that's so important to deepening the work that we're doing as a school. And um, I just really, again, I want to applaud you both for really thinking about that and working on that um, in such a, um, an intentional way because I think that's critical to the success of our students and, and you're showing us right because kids who participate are doing better academically and and they're having broader stronger experiences that take them out of here into you know their lives and I, I just think those are terrific things so I wanted to give a shout out for those Great. thank, thank you, you both. Well, so may I you. give one more shout out? Certainly, <laughs> go right ahead. The, these two people yeah. <laughs> are drop dead fantastic. Yeah. And, and Denise, I'll include you in that. I better say three. Yes. But since they're sitting at the table, I just want to say the, the personal commitment yeah. and enthusiasm and concern for students and, and understanding of the culture of the school and the systemic work that we're doing mm -hmm. here both of these people get it, and they live it every day, and I think it's showing mm -hmm. in what you're seeing mm -hmm. happening in the, in the mm -hmm. programs that they, that they supervise and lead. Thank so you. to both of you, thank well, you. And I keep whispering to Pat how awesome these goals are. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, if you're talking about it, we are talking about systemic changes. That's what this is. Yeah. And these are conversations that have been had over and over again. And to see this is amazing. So Thank it's you. amazing. Oh, and Nicole, I didn't mention, and some people can do more with balloons than anybody <laughs> oh, my I've goodness. ever known in my life. <laughs>
Oh, but yeah. can't do it quite she, like you do it. <laughs> she, uh, it is always amazing. Try. Well, the, the one event I didn't see her put up there that she pulled off was uh, she actually did back to back. Uh, she did the um, the watch party, which we just threw together because we kept getting bombarded by people saying, "Hey, I can't get down to the basketball." game is there anything you guys can do with the new tvs in the the gym and i was like i don't know and i think i called her at like 11 30 that night and she's like yeah 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 we can do we can do something and then i saw pictures of everything she did and it's not something i mean it was like there'd be people that would spend months planning what she she pulled off in in less than 24 hours they pulled off in less than 24 hours and the next day the the final four party was just it was incredible what she she can put together an event better than anybody i've ever seen so, yes. If you got anyone you. getting married, <laughs> <laughs> give her a ring. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Wow. Great. Great, great. Okay. Um, so item number eight, comments from the public. Dr. Davis, what do we have? We have no comments from the public this evening. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, FOIA? <laughs> FOIA. Uh, we have three FOIAs, uh, Srinan, Janig, and Walk, and the responses are in your packet. Okay, thank you. Uh, board committee reports. And so we have, uh, we thought we'd start with the report on the National Summit for Courageous Conversations. Four of us went to the summit. Um, Liz Rolowitz, Stephanie Teteritz, Monique Parsons, and I. So maybe we'll just um, give our reports in that order. So Liz, would you like to start us off? Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all for sending me to National Summit. I know that it's some, a training that's been going on for many years here, but that was my first time. Um, it was a real honor to be in a space with people who are not af afraid to speak plainly about race and racism. Um, it was a really, unique and special environment to be in. Um, and to see the marginalized voices uplifted and centered throughout the entire um, summit with our speakers, our leaders, our teachers, um, even just in our small groups, um, always, always being able to um, center those voices and prioritize them meant so much for me to be able to see that. Um, and it was a, just a real gift to be able to learn from people outside of my identity group. Um, so I was really honored to be a part of that. Um, some things that I was, that would have been on my mind since returning from Summit um, are kind of just like thinking about uh, how do we center marginalized voices here at ETHS and uh, making sure that they're heard by the people in power in our school. And I was thinking as a board member, um, I don't have broad access to our students, and so I do wonder about um, being able to hear firsthand from them and what their needs are and being in a position to make decisions for them, but in my position here, um, maybe not knowing exactly what their needs are. And so it's something I'm going to be thinking about as a board member of how we can sort of provide space for those student voices that we don't always hear like at our meetings and that I personally um, don't have access to. So that's something on my mind. And secondly, um, just about being reminded of how fortunate we are to be in this district and the work that's been going on here for so long and sort of seeing uh, the contrast of other districts around the country who are either very early on in their conversations in this work or just really struggling to find support. Um, either they don't have support with their boards or their administration or their parents and feeling really um, fortunate and almost spoiled um, that we are so far in this work. And um, it makes me think about our sort of responsibility as um, a board and as the district to be a model and be a leader for other districts around the country to um, be able to come to us with um, questions like, how do we do this? Um, when we, the four of us led a session um, about board equity and, you know, it was just clear that a lot of members that were attending were, um, 
really just struggling, like how do I get this work done and I don't have the support and how do I get the support and I just was thinking about, you know, and I don't, I'm sure Eric gets requests all the time for how do we do this in our district and it shouldn't all fall onto him, but just sort of thinking about, um, you know, how do we create like best practices and an outline for sharing this type of equity work for for other districts and other boards to sort of model um, and be able, and of course we can easily show them our success stories and our, our growth in the last decade, um, but just sort of thinking about our responsibility on a larger scale beyond just ETHS um, as far as doing this kind of work in, in schools. So thank you again for sending me. Thank you, thank you Liz, awesome. Stephanie. I wrote something, so if you'll bear with me, I'm, I'm just going to read what I wrote and reflecting on, on our time in New Orleans at the National Summit. The theme for this year's National Summit for Courageous Conversation was building bridges, not borders. Acknowledging that borders, like race itself, are social constructions, imaginary notions of boundary, made real by practices and relationships imposed and forced and reiterated. Whereas bridges are actual physical structures constructed to facilitate travel across impassable divides, natural and man-made. Given this particular moment in our national consciousness, building bridges, not borders, seems to be the perfect description of what teachers and educators do on a daily basis at ETHS and what we as members of, district, of the District 202 Board have pledged to support through our own engagement with this work for the purpose of transforming systemic barriers into racially conscious, socially just environments that nurture the spirit and the infinite potential of all students to live their most powerful and empowered lives. In our District 202 goals for 2017 to 2022, we state that we recognize that racism is the most devastating factor contributing to the diminished achievement of students and that ETHS will strive to eliminate the predictability of academic achievement based on race. But we cannot hope to eliminate the racial predict racially predictable outcomes of our lives unless we discuss race and racism in a way that is earnest, honest, and sustainable. This is the deep work of courageous conversations. At this year's national summit, 1,200 educators from around the country and abroad were invited to explore the boundaries erected by race in our own lives, personal, professional, and organizational. Each and every one of us took this opportunity to survey the divides between our racial ideals and our lived experiences, and to open ourselves to the wholeness of our humanity and community and fellowship with colleagues and peers. Having participated in two Beyond Diversity trainings, through the city of Evanston and District 65, I was able, with my good colleague Liz Rolowitz, to participate in the next level two-day Beyond Diversity II and to use the tools that we learned in previous trainings, the compass and the four agreements and the six conditions, to deepen my self-reflection and to develop my own personal racial equity purpose, appropriately known as PREP, so that as a white woman I can gain the skill, capacity, knowledge and will to be more effective and persistent in my anti-racist practice. I was also proud to host a presentation with my board colleagues, Pat Savage-Williams, Monique Parsons, and Liz Rolowitz on boardroom racial equity, in which we discussed moving racial equity from theory to practice at the board level with about 40 attendees. I want the Evanston community to know that Evanston Township High School is truly leading the way in its effort to transform barriers of inequity into racially conscious, socially just pathways that nurture the spirit and the infinite potential of all people in our community, especially our students of color, who are most negatively impacted by the walls of adversity that exist all around us. We are a model for educators, schools, and districts around the country. We should be proud of all that we have accomplished and persistent with all that we have yet to do. Finally, gratitude. Gratitude to my colleagues on the board, the ETHS administration and staff, and the Evanston community for leaning into this work with me. You know who you are. I am proud to be on this path with you in this work of building bridges and not borders. It is truly an honor and a gift. Thank you.
Thank you. Monique. Sure. So I, I first want to also acknowledge the staff that also went to the conference and just how um, it's nice to say, to shout out how many of us are really there doing this work. Um, and, and then to, to see the response from the people you share that with at the summit, it's, it's just remarkable. So um, I just you know, wanna thank the leadership staff for keeping this um, on the table and making it a part of the fabric of who we are at ETHS. Um, so I always leave the summit thinking, wow, if our entire community participated in this summit, if our entire state participated in this summit, if the entire world <laughs> participated in the summit, how much better we would be, um, how much braver and bolder we would be to have these conversations and to not have the issues that we have and not to have, and not have the um, facade that we put up around racial equity, um, to not throw lingo around, that we have no clear reference point of um, why we're saying what we're saying or what we're saying, what, what's being said. Um, to be able to speak on one accord, how great would we be? And, and so, you know, it, it is always um, my goal. I think I've always said that it's important that we do the work individually. Um, but it's also important that we do it collectively if we are to be a stronger board um, for this, for our kids, for our students. That's, that's the ultimate goal. It's all about them. And, and how much better we would be as a community if we um, said, if you're doing the beyond diversity work locally, um, then you know, how deep, much more deeper can we get in being truly committed to this work of equity? And it, it requires um, all of us to be vulnerable. It requires us to be able to, to have very uncomfortable conversations and to also get that feedback and be able to have discussions back and forth. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I always leave saying, wow, you know, I just wish that everybody would leave their biases and leave their opinions about um, who's delivering this work and take it for what it is and what it needs to be and that is to create a better school, a better community and a better world for the kids that we are responsible for. Um, so I, I absolutely, to, to Pat, for pulling together um, the presentation that for the second year, I think, in yeah. a role that we've mm -hmm. been able to, to give mm -hmm. and just the feedback that we receive from those that participate in the workshop it's very difficult for us to get through the presentation because people are just so full of wanting information. And our journey is so important. And um, I had the responsibility this time to, to sort of lay out the timeline, Eric. And I started from when you were hired. And that's not on the timeline, but I went all the way back then because that that's important, that's critical, and that's important for a board to understand that you have to pick the right leader to do this work. Um, and so it's, it's just amazing that the people, are, they are just, just yearning for information and a journey to say, yes, this is hard work, but guess what? They're doing it and we can do it too. So, um, Pat, thank you for the presentation, for, for continuing to put us out there, and um, as we're presenting, we're also learning, and we're, we're engaged in, in conversations that are difficult to have, but that we come back here fired up um, to say that, yes, we're doing the work, but there's so much more that we can do. And, um, and I, I absolutely just put a challenge out there to, to people in the community that our elected officials, our um, community members that have participated in Beyond Diversity. It doesn't stop there. That's just one aspect. It's the beginning. Um, it's, it's the, like, it's the, yeah, the, it's the beginning of the first. formal work. Mm -hmm. um, but you really need to go deeper if we are to, to get further. So um, I think next year it's in Texas, Austin. Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, 
how great would it be to have uh, twice the number of people from Evanston that are just not from District 65 and 202 participate in this summit? So, thank you. Wow. Um, so, I too want to just thank the district um, and the administration and um, my school board colleagues for uh, leading this work, um, leading this work in such a meaningful way because um, we have a lot of responsibilities on the board. We're, um, we're governing this district, uh, we have fiscal responsibilities, we're responsible for the, the students and, um, and our equity work is the foundation. Um, and it is an honor for me to be a part of a board that um, can take what we do and tell our story at a national conference. Um, and um, the, the evaluation forms haven't come in yet, but um, from what I've heard, just uh, word on the street is <laughs> um, on the streets of New Orleans, no doubt. <laughs> so whatever that means, <laughs> I'll take it, is that it was really well received and it was really good. So it's, it's, it was just, it's a powerful experience. I always expect it to be a powerful experience. Um, and I do have uh, the stress of the presentation, but the excitement of all the people who are leaders in this work and learning from um, the, the most prominent leaders in the country. So, um, and I do, and I did, and it was amazing, and I connected with folks and heard some presentation. I heard a presentation specifically for women of color in leadership uh, from a group in New York. And, um, and it was really powerful, and I, um, man, it was just affirming, and um, I, I just just learned so much. So just just so much of that, more more of that. Um, Monique is correct. Beyond diversity is the first training. It's the foundation, the first training, and then there's Beyond Diversity two and Beyond Diversity three now, and then there are other um, sessions that are really good. There are uh, sessions for students. Um, so um, there's lots to do and lots, lots, a lot of work to do. And I really would love to, um, to see more of us go, um, to see more from Evanston, from the Evanston community participate um, in addition to Evanston High School. It, it's great, I think, and, and um, powerful for us as a board to learn alongside of staff and faculty. And uh, we were in sessions with staff and faculty from Evanston, so it, that's really powerful to, to be in sessions with, with, our, with, with our staff from, from the district. Um, but wow, how powerful it would be if we could have more um, from other places in our community. Um, so, that's the challenge, to continue the work. We are, and you've heard me say this before, I believe we're at the hardest place in the work because what we're doing now um, is the hardest part. It's easy to go to sessions and sit and get and learn, but it's harder to actually apply what we've done and what we've taken in, and that's where we are. We're applying it, we heard it. Um, we heard it when we, when we talked about discipline a few weeks ago. We heard it as we were talking about activities and athletics. This is the conversation that needs to happen at the board level while being true to our integrity as a school board and staying in our lane as a school board. There's lots still we can do. So I want us to continue to stay in our lane, but I want us to continue the work and continue learning um, so I will continue to bring to this board um, I, ideas and readings and books and speakers and opportunities for us to do that because that's the only way we'll learn. This is the adaptive leadership work. This is that, I call it swiggly line, but this is that, that area of uh, productive disequilibrium 
that's where we are. And that's where we'll stay over time so that we can um, continue to come up with ideas and respond to what's in front of us. So thank you again. Thank you for going. And thank you for engaging. And let's continue this work. Thank you. Right. OK, so my computer is taking a nap here. Student board report. Oh, that's always most exciting. <laughs> Hello. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about two things. The first is Wild Kid Futures Day. Um, so this was a half day, um, I believe last Wednesday, that all four grades participated in. Um, the freshmen uh, had a presentation from Calvin Terrell, who is an extremely engaging speaker that talks about diversity, prejudice, and historical trauma. Um, it's a a very unique experience for freshmen um, because it's one of the only times where almost the entire class is together in the same space and truly engaged in, in what they're there to do. Um, which kind of brings me to what the sophomores did on that day, which was uh, ac uh, career clusters, um, school photos, um, and then there was a video, I believe, prepared by Calvin um, to further that conversation that, and that dialogue that they established freshman year. Um, but I think looking forward, I know that there was time during that day that the sophomores um, weren't occupied with something. And so thinking about how we can continue to grow that conversation and continuing that conversation with Calvin um, would be, I think, amazing. And that's the feedback that a lot of students have given as well. Um, the juniors uh, were taking the PSAT. Um, and this is one of their first experiences with standardized tests. They will have taken the PSAT 10 prior to that um, as well. But this is when it's becoming really um, important for their college process. Um, and it always raises the question of um, how students know that it's coming, um, what preparation they've had for it, um, and kind of how they understand that it's an opportunity to get scholarship money is, I think, always a question that are people aware of the National Merit Scholarship Program. Um, and then finally, the seniors were having a day of taking the senior photo, which is, was extremely exciting, and a lot of students showed up. We had students lined up on the floor, um, which usually doesn't happen. Um, and um, we learned about uh, how to move forward with buying your uh, gown for graduation. Um, and so in the most immediate sense, the seniors were really thinking about their futures on that day. Um, there was a lot of time to work on college applications and scholarships as well for many students, um, which was extremely helpful um, from what people have said. Um, and then the next thing that I want to talk about is the end of the quarter. So that was uh, last Friday, um, which means that uh, for freshmen, it was their first time having a quarter at ETHS and um, their grades for that quarter will impact their final grade for the semester. Ooh. Um, and that is a big step in understanding the structure of your grades. Um, and I think for the most part, uh, there's a lot of support for them to be able to understand that. And so the teachers are also working to um, help students get the things that they need to get in earlier than later um, as the quarter ends. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Echo. Dr. Witherspoon. Well, thanks, Echo. Those good, good topics. <laughs> and for anybody who doesn't understand what in the world is Futures Day, I think you just did a fabulous yes. job of, of bringing that alive. Yes. Uh, thanks for that suggestion for the sophomores. Mm -hmm. we'll, 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 we'll spend a little more time on that one. Um, so uh, my, my report is actually fairly brief tonight. Uh, but I, I do want to point out that the um, um, ETHS Band and Orchestra Fall Music Fest is going to be next Wednesday, October, or I'm sorry, this Wednesday, October 23rd. It's at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. Every time I announce one of these, I, uh, I, I have to say it again, and, and the, I'm going to announce the choir concert, but I'll say it too, and then I'll make my comment about both of them. And the choir concert is going to be uh, coming up on Tuesday, November 5th, and that'll be at 7 p.m. And I just have to say to anybody listening in, if you've never been to one of our fall conference concerts or winter or spring, attend, attend, attend. They are free. They are hugely attended. And every time it's kind of like, you know, when I go to the spring musical or, or one of our plays, we just keep marveling and say, 
these are high school level students, <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, you know, uh, performing and, 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 and f functioning at this level, really, really something. So again, the band concert uh, uh, this Wednesday, the 23rd, the, the choir, uh, uh, choir concert um, coming up on Tuesday, November 5th. Uh, it's a great evening. People pay for entertainment like yeah. this. Yeah. And all we have to do is go to free parking and enjoy a great <laughs> evening. Um, uh, we also have the fall freshman and sophomore play uh, coming up this week. It'll be Thursday. Um, uh, 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 Friday and Saturday of this week, the 24th, 25th, and 26th. It's in the Little Theater. Uh, it, all performances are 7.30 in the evening, and you can go to the website uh, if you want to purchase uh, tickets in advance. They're also available at the door. Uh, we have another fan event coming up. Uh, we have been packing the house on fan events. Holy cow. Uh, this one's a little, a, 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 a little different approach. It's actually on a a Saturday evening, uh, this Saturday, the 26th. It's in the auditorium, begins at 7, and it's actually uh, the, titled The Year of the Monkey, an Evening with Patti Smith. So uh, if you would like, again, uh, just a wonderful free evening uh, 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 of, of really enjoyment, uh, plan to come to ETHS Saturday evening. Um, want to mention uh, that uh, we have the, uh, they're actually still calling it the Latino Heritage Festival or the Latinx uh, Heritage Festival. It's on Friday, November 1st. It's at 6.30 p.m. in our auditorium. Uh, and that uh, uh, is also free. And uh, it has music, dance, culture. Uh, it, it, it's just a festive uh, a wonderful, wonderful Latinx experience. So uh, again, that is coming up, um, I, I, I'm afraid I just said this Friday, a week from Friday, Friday, November 1st uh, is, is when that is. And finally, um, and, and this is just great. Again, this is one of the things that we've started in recent years and it's so cool. Uh, uh, but we're inviting all prospective eighth grade students and their families to attend the incoming freshman information night. It's on Wednesday, November 6th, begins at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. They will be getting information and, and invitations, but I just want to stress that they learn so much about uh, the freshman transition pro uh, process and what to expect at ETHS. There's information on the website, but I must tell you, it is such an event to have all these uh, uh, you know, eighth graders who are going to be incoming freshmen and their families come uh, for that information night. It, it is just a fabulous uh, evening. And that does conclude my report. Uh, thank you. Wow. We're talking about the next class already. So I, I, that I, it's really a, means... It's the blink of an eye. It is. I it's know. just really amazing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any more Committee reports. Um, yeah, I kind of went over that very quickly. All right, so we're at um, the Finance Committee. So we are now officially the Finance Committee, and we're going to hear uh, from Mary Rodino. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. So this is the time I'm used to being up, so <laughs> I, I feel much better. I was a little... Yeah, we did I that I didn't know purpose. what to do last time when I was up at 8.30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just have like 13 or 14 slides, nothing real detailed, not a lot of schedules of a bunch of numbers like we sometimes do with the budget presentation. Um, but I do want to go through, through some things that we've talked about before. I know we have a couple of... Um, new board members and um, I'll certainly take any questions I don't mean to gloss over some things but nothing really is um, too revelational except we have more needs than we have money but that's the story every year <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about a background I tried to give you as much background as I could in the board memo just of some basic things about sources of money and um, the needs of the district, but we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about some of the projects, which um, 
it's a timely discussion because the board saw most of those. Uh, I think it was last board meeting. Um, and then the capital improvements in general and our financial plan going forward. So what I typically give you in the fall, we're a little bit earlier than we usually are um, because we had been bringing this to you in November. And then um, it's a little bit harder process to get bids ready and out before um, the new year when we don't come to you until November. And so by doing this in October, it'll give us hopefully a little bit of a head start on next summer's project because what we're being told by our architects is that um, because the economy is pretty strong, it's been harder and harder to get um, some of the construction companies. They're already committed sometimes by January. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we get the best deals and doing that would be getting things in early. So what we consider capital items are anything uh, valued over $25,000 other than like, um, you know, a repair or something that's expensed. And as you know, we have over 1.2 million square feet of building and 60 plus acres of campus. It's not too easy to see with the lights on. Um, this picture is about three or four years old. Most of um, the representation is still the case, except the planetarium's a different color. That's how I can always tell how old the picture is. <laughs> um, and I noticed our geometry and construction lot is not on this photo. So, um, But there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of roofs. There's a lot of grounds. There's a lot of building. Um, and so it's always a challenge. So we use multiple funding sources, uh, GO or general obligation bonds, things called debt certificates, which work very much like general obligation bonds. And I always like to talk about that one time, like six or seven years ago, Mark Metz always used to like clap and we'd talk about this. Um, there was a qualified zone academy bond issuance and we basically got, I think it was four million, might have been five million for like zero interest. So Mark always used to ask if we could yeah. just get more of that and we can't. But um, so we're still paying that off, but that was basically free money to us. So those are some of the ways that we finance these projects. Um, We've also been fortunate to have some very successful TIFs in Evanston, and so uh, we try to reserve the money as TIFs expire for capital expenditures. And of course, foundation donations, as you all know, um, the Wildcat Wellness Center um, was only obtainable through the generous donation of um, Mr. Arrington and, and other donors. So we rely on all of those things. Uh, we're not really able to fund all of our capital needs. Our depreciation on what we have now is, is about $3.3 million annually. Mm -hmm. And so that means in order to stay ahead of the game, you'd want to spend more than that um, on your facilities. So we should really be spending about 4 to $6 million, but we really can only afford 2 to $3 million. Um, that is mostly because there are legal caps on how much debt we can issue. Um, you know, we wouldn't want a lot of payments, but we could probably afford a little more, but we're not allowed to because of the legal caps that are on how much debt we can issue. So our five-year uh, CIP plan, I might have skipped this point in one of the slides, but when we present a five-year plan, it's a recap of the year we're just finishing, and then it's four years out in the future. So when you look at those five years, uh, the capital needs are about $30.5 million. So the approval by the board is for one year of the plan, which will be the next summer, and then estimates for the future years. But we always refine those estimates in future years. And if you look at that five-year plan that I presented in the memo, it never balances for the out years because there's always more need than we have money. And so when the time gets closer, we have to sort of pick and choose between what's the most urgent and... Um, which items can we push out a little bit further? So we, we divide these things into, into categories, um, site improvements and then mechanical, electrical and plumbing, toilets and roofs, masonry, windows, and asbestos removal, and then educational facilities. So the major improvements, which I think you've seen almost all of these, uh, the Wildcat Wellness and Performance Center, the cardio room, the upstairs theater rehearsal space, the back three rooms of the upstairs theater, uh, windows, which probably none of you have even noticed, but that's okay, I noticed them. Um, on the East School, on the Dodge side, um, it was more work than you could imagine just trying to have a company uh, replicate the windows that we have throughout the rest of the building, but update them so that the look would be the same, um, but the function is new instead of you know 50 60 years old 
Um, so we did a significant part of East School on the Dodge Avenue side and a little bit on the north side. Um, to be honest, that's something you're going to be hearing about for probably 10 years here. It's going to probably take that long to replace all the windows. Uh, we're trying to attack the ones that are leaking the worst, um, the ones that are, are in the worst condition, but it is a huge expense that this district is going to have to be stuck with and it's not pretty I mean nobody notices when you replace windows but it's really needed uh, the last piece uh, which wasn't a big capital expense but since you all saw it I wanted to put it on here the literacy lab which was a transformation of um, just an old classroom in addition we had um, the first year of the boys locker room renovations our uh, Chris mentioned a lot of these football turf locker room three and the hallway between PE and athletics so we did a lot of work in that area of the building this year. So future needs, as I mentioned, windows, that's going to be here longer than I'll be probably. Um, outdoor facilities like the track and um, some turf and some of the fields. Uh, Multi-year projects that we've talked about like locker rooms and um, the auditorium lights and sound. And then auditorium HVAC is also a big need that we'll get to in the next couple years. So our plan is to utilize debt, debt certificates and bond funds, which um, we'll issue something in the spring of 2020. We'll bring that back to the board well ahead of when construction would start. Uh, we will have foundation contributions to funds. Uh, we have typically each year we have a sale of our geometry and construction house. We do have a contract on the most recent house, so that's good news. Um, and then sometimes we do transfer funds from our operations and maintenance fund. So the recommendation is for the board to approve the five-year capital improvements plan uh, and recommend proceeding on the plans for the summer or fiscal 2020 capital improvement construction program. And I think that is it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them based on the memo or any questions you might have or um, specific projects. Um, I will say just kind of to highlight what's in that Excel spreadsheet, uh, the big things off the top of my head, for next summer, um, outdoor track, um, auditorium, lighting and sound. That's going to be a multi-year project, and it's going to ramp up a little slower than we thought um, because what we're hearing from consultants and architects is that it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to need to be pretty in intricately designed, and so we want to make sure that we approach that major renovation cautiously. So we're going to ramp that up this summer, uh, replace the old district PA system. Marcus likes to carry around a picture of how he tapes the phone to a speaker or something. I don't know. I skipped that posting on Facebook when I saw that. Um, I didn't want to give him a frown emoji. Uh, South School Roof, that's one that really needs to be done. We're going to be working on that next summer. And, and I think rather than working on more windows next summer, we have a lot of masonry work, a lot of leaks that go all the way up to the fourth floor. So we're going to be trying to address those as well. And then there's some Wi-Fi upgrades um, and some network IT switches. So there's some technological infrastructure, if you will. So th those are the highlights for next summer. Nothing too flashy, maybe the track. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Maintaining our building. Oh, my gosh. Yes. It, one cycle just goes right into yes, the next. Yes, right you know, into the, the next. Projects the are barely building. finished, and we're yeah. already meeting for um, some of the projects for next summer just to, to wow. start listening to stakeholders and take right. some input on those. Right. So it's a continuous cycle. And I really wish we had more money. <laughs> but we don't. We really don't. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I just, my goal is to kind of try to hold tight and prioritize. Yes. And um, I don't know. Great. Yes, Echo. On the South School roof, would it be able to, like, house um, renewable energy sources? You know, we've been approached a few times about roofs. Um, I don't think that one in particular was one that had the best sun exposure. Okay. But certainly we have had conversations. Unfortunately, like one of the best is um, the Beardsley Gym Roof. And I, I, don't, I don't even know when that would be replaced. But, but certainly it's been a conversation and we don't ever want to consider things like solar panels on older roofs. Um, but but it is something that once those roofs are in place, we could at least consider. Got it. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. 
All right. So we are at our action item, and look at that. Our first action item <laughs> is approval of capital improvement program. Can we have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. The next item is approval of course change proposals that we looked at last month. So last. moved. Can I add one just highlight in the in the certainly one highlight? Um, I'm actually also going to seek uh, a course code for advanced topics in social science, which we could potentially pilot with Northwestern, and it would be a hybrid course with Northwestern students and ETHS students. It's very much in the pilot stage, but the first step in that is to secure a course code, so I included it in this uh, memo. Okay. So mo moved with the amendment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that the, okay. Yes. Second. Is. Other questions? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Yes, thank you. The next item is approval of press policy issue number 101. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 The next item is the consent agenda, which consists of the approval of minutes from October 7, 2019. Closed session meeting, October 7, 2019, regular meeting. Treasurer's report from August 2019. Approval of bills, personnel agenda, change in status, stipends, resignations, support staff and exempt, retirement, safety, and an addendum, which includes educational, change in lane, and retirement nutrition services. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Carson. Yes. 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 Thank you. All right. Um, we are at old and new business. Does anybody have old or new business to present? Gretchen? New business. I'm going to make it really fast because I know we're going to be done with this meeting by 930. Um, <laughs> so the I just want to call your attention to um, the Advance Illinois report on the state of edu education in Illinois that I sent around to the, the board and um, uh, Eric and others mm -hmm. earlier today. Um, I went to the rollout of the report last week. It was a terrific talk by Robin Staines. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in here compiled in a pretty helpful way and they're going to have an interactive form of the report where we can pull out our own district sometime this winter. But in the meantime, there's lots of stuff to look at here. And it gives us, you know, the metrics, if you go to the sort of very end, you can see the detailed numerical breakdown by region and by state for many of the same metrics that we are also looking at, and it would be nice to sort of look at our work um, within this kind of a framework. Um, so for example, the outcomes for ninth through 12th grade are percentage of students taking early college coursework, percentage of students taking AP exams, percentage of AP exams passed, high school seniors earning AP college credit in Illinois, because we have that cool provision here. Uh, percentage of students meeting benchmarks on the ACT, ACT, SAT, students getting the seal by, by literacy, students getting, you know, uh, endorsements for career pathways, freshmen on track, and graduation rate. Anyway, very helpful, well presented. Um, and then also pay attention at the end, this is something I really didn't know anything about and was only touched on briefly in the report, um, but it's this group, uh, it's called the Illinois Equity and Attainment Initiative. It's a group of colleges in Illinois focused on, um, well, they're guided by principles around equity, supporting students, um, and closing the racial and socioeconomic completion gaps in Illinois. Um, so kind of an interesting 
uh, thing. And this whole report actually touches, they have a whole section on post-secondary. So anyway, lots of interesting stuff. Sorry I'm taking us too long. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to looking at that. Thank you for sending that. All right. Um, polling of the board. Anybody have anything to add? I would just like to add, um, I went to see Yamo this weekend and um, very interesting. Uh, my favorite was the assimilation scene. It was really good. Wow. It was quick, but it was really good. So it was awesome. All right. Can we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's 929. Woohoo! Good job, Pat. Hey.